welcome to this webinar on IHA Myeloma Highlights organized by Myeloma Patients Europe. I'm Solène Clavreul and I will be the moderator of this webinar. Next slide. So I will start um, with uh, the agenda of today. We will start with a short introduction and housekeeping rules. And then our speaker, Dr. Hermine Anzele, will present his myeloma highlights from the IHA conference um, 2024. And we will then continue with a question and answer session before closing the webinar at 6 p.m. Next slide, please. Um, just a few housekeeping rules um, about how to use Zoom webinar. So attendees are not seen or heard uh, in the webinar. You should be able to see and hear the presenters, but you will not be able to see or hear other attendees, and they will also not be able to see or hear you. If you cannot hear the presenters, make sure that your speakers are not muted and that the volume is set high. You can use the question and answer um, also called Q&A feature, which is found on the toolbar at the bottom of the window to ask your questions. Um, and um, you can click on the like button to upvote a question and let us know what questions are, high, are of high interest to you. Um, so if we have a lot of questions, this will help us prioritizing them. Don't wait until the end to ask your questions because we will sort them um, by topic um, while Dr. Einzel is presenting. Um, and uh, next slide, please. You can use the chat feature to chat with other participants, share your experiences or comments on the current discussion. You can also consider audio only if you're having any troubles with poor video or, or if the signal is cutting in or out. Um, so in that case, consider attending in audio mode only and bypassing the video. If you're experiencing any technical issue, please let us know about it here in the chat or send us an email and one of my colleagues will try to assist you. Do not use the chat to ask your questions, but rather use the Q&A feature for that purpose. If you don't see the toolbar at the bottom or at the top of the Zoom window, move your mouse um, slightly and the bar uh, should appear. The bar disappears after a few seconds uh, when you are in full screen mode. Um, so just um, for the notice, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our websites, uh, www.mperot.org and social media channels. Um, so now let's speak about EHA. So EHA stands for European Hematology Association. It's an organization that supports and connects hematologists worldwide. It promotes excellence in patient care, research, and education in hematology towards a cure for all blood disorders. And they have programs and services to serve medical professionals, researchers, and scientists. And as part of those programs, every year they organize an international conference with several educational programs, lectures, symposia, and scientific sessions. The meeting also features oral and poster presentations containing um, developments in scientific research. Um, and the 2024 Annual Congress was the 29th uh, conference, and it was held last month in Madrid, Spain. So we have organized this webinar to share with you the highlights of the conference. And so you can also ask your questions related to the latest results presented at the conference um, to Dr. Einzele, our speaker of the day. So I'm very pleased uh, to welcome our speaker of the day, Dr. Herm Hermann Einzele. Uh, he's a hematologist, a oncologist, and a researcher. He's currently professor of internal medicine and the director of the Department of Internal Medicine II at the University Hospital Würzburg in Germany. He's considered uh, one of the world's leading experts in the field of multiple myeloma and cellular immunotherapy, and in, in particular, CAR T cells and bispecific antibodies. In 2014, he was elected to the Academy of Science and Literature in Mainz, Germany, and he's so famous that he 
even has his own Wikipedia page. Um, <laughs> so Dr. Einzele has been and still is involved in many research projects uh, that have led to the approval of many myeloma treatments, and he has received multiple awards uh, for his work. So I'm very, very pleased um, to have him today. And I thank you, uh, Dr. Einzeli, for being there and for dedicating some of your precious time to MPE. So the floor is yours. Uh, and you can present uh, your myeloma highlights for me. Hiha. Yeah, thank you very much indeed for this kind introduction. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure and honor to speak to patients, Myeloma Patients Europe. And I'm just starting trying to, yeah. Can you see my slides? Yes. Very good. So I have to go back to the start. So, yeah. So EHA was a very important meeting. We had nearly 20,000 people attending, and there was a lot of new information about multiple myeloma. So I try to kind of um, categorize these novel informations that came from the presentations at, at EHA. So this is what we consider the standard treatment for a patient with a newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, who according to the um, uh, treating physician is considered to be transplant eligible. The patient should receive a four drug regimen and there was some new data about the combination of VRD, that's VELK, botesumib, Revlimid, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, and an anti-CD38 antibody, daratumumab. This is then followed by stem cell transplantation. And then there is a maintenance. And the question that also comes up after these presentations, where the maintenance should be just lenalidomide or whether we should also include a daratumumab. I have an issue removing the slides. Let me see. Yeah, I think now it's working. So still high-dose chemotherapy and stem cell transplantation are considered a, a very important part of the first-line treatment. And these are data that are dating back from 2011, and they show that in a patient who achieves a complete remission following stem cell transplantation, that this patient has an option to have a long-term disease-free survival. So patients that achieve a complete remission, 25 to 30% are still disease-free after about 15 to 20 years. Now the, the issue or the, the next generation of treatments was then to add in novel agents with stem cell transplantation. And this is the so-called Perseo study in which you can see that either VRD prior or post-transplant and a lenalidomid maintenance were given to the patients or the four-track regimen, including daratumumab prior and post-transplant and also as an intensified maintenance therapy. So what does the addition of daratumumab to all parts of the treatment actually bring to the outcome to our patients? And this was quite impressive. Adding daratumumab to the induction, maintenance, uh, uh, um, consolidation and maintenance improved the progression-free survival at four years from 67 to 84% which I think is much more important, that's a prediction. When I started to work in the field of multiple myeloma, the median um, progression-free survival, even overall survival was between two and three years. Now, with this novel treatment, with a four-track regimen plus transplant and a two-track maintenance, the prediction is that the median progression-free survival will be about 200 months so that means more than 15 years. And this shows how much we have improved treatment in multiple myeloma. 
Now, what we also learned, and that was intensively discussed at this meeting, is we should not only go for complete remission, but rather for MRD negativity. And MRD negativity means that we try to detect only one tumor cell in one million tumor cells in the bone marrow. So a very sensitive technology. And if we find a patient to be MRD negative, so no myeloma cells, even at a sensitivity one of one million cells, then the risk of progression is rather low. It's actually about 20% after six years, and we are increasing now using this MRD measurement to decide whether we continue treatment uh, in a patient or to stop treatment. And this is a study that was shown by the group in Chicago, where they measured MRD, um, and if a patient was MRD negative and also PET negative, following the treatment, then they stopped maintenance therapy. So they stopped lenalidomid and they showed that even after stopping lenalidomid in a patient who is MRD negative, the risk of uh, disease recurrence is only about 15% after three years. So we have new tools to detect patients where we can actually safely stop treatment. The other issue is how to treat patients who are not transplant eligible. And here DARA RD was the main treatment option that we had. And just to remind you, DARA RD brought a median progression free survival of about five years, much better than RD alone. And now at EHA, there was a new strategy. Now not using three drugs, but using four drugs. And this is the treatment that you can see here. It's the combination of isatuximab, an anti-CD38 antibody, Velcade, Revlimid, and dexamethasone. And with this, the 60 months progression-free survival is 63%, and the projected median progression-free survival is seven to eight years. So again, a further improvement in the treatment for our patients. But we still have issues. One issue is clearly patients with high-risk cytogenetics. And you can see here that these patients who have two or more high-risk cytogenetic features have a much worse outcome when compared to patients that only one or no cytogenetic features. Uh, features. Cytogenetic features are translocation 414, translocation 14, 16, 14, 20, or especially 70p deletion and also alterations of chromosome 1. The second issue that we have or the second unmet medical need are patients that have an early relapse following first-line therapy, especially followed following transplant. These patients do rather poorly so also for these patients, we need new treatment options. And finally, because we add more and more drugs in first and second line therapy, we end up in patients that have been exposed to all three agents like proteasome inhibitors, IMIDs, and anti-CD38 antibodies. And if you have already used these three classes of drugs, then the outcome is rather poor. The overall response rate is only about 30%, median progression free survival about 4.6 months. So again, for these patients, we need new treatment options and we have new treatment options. One of them is really CAR T cells. There are a lot of targets on the myeloma cells that can be addressed by, by a, a CAR T cell. Mainly now we are targeting BCMA, and you can see here the so-called KARMA trial in which patients that had six lines of prior therapy were exposed to all these novel agents. And you see that with this treatment, 
I, so, I showed you the, 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 the current results. It was 30% overall response rate, median progression, free survival, four months. Now here, the overall response rate is 81% and median progression, free survival, about 11.3 months. So much, much better than with conventional treatment. And with the other treatment that is also available now, Silta cell, the responses are even better. 97% of these patients are responding and the complete remission rate is 82% and the median progression free survival. Remember the four months I showed you before, here it's 34.9 months. So this is really a completely new treatment um, uh, uh, potential that we have never seen in for these patients. And actually the toxicity, we have some toxicity. The toxicity is the cytopenia. So these patients have neutropenia, they get some infections, but the infection rate is not very high. We see cytokine release syndrome, that is fevers, um, some drop in the blood pressure, but it's normally easily manageable in, in patients after CAR T cell therapy. The only issue there is, is the so-called late neurotoxicity. I'm going to address this later. The other option are bispecific antibody. And here you see a, quite a range of bispecific antibodies. Now to bring them in, in relationship to the CAR T cells, CAR T cells, we see a response is up to 97% with um, the bispecifics we get responses in 60 to 70%. With the CAR T cells, complete remission rate up to 82% with the bispecific antibodies in the range of 35 to 40%. Medium progression free survival with the CAR T cells about 36 months, nearly three years with the bispecifics between one and one and a half years. So. There is some difference in the response rate and also in the disease control, but bispecific antibodies are off the shelf as, um, products, so you can have them easily available. One issue with bispecifics is a quite high rate of infectious complications, which is currently addressed. And what we increasingly learn, and I think this is important also for patients to know this, up to now, these bispecific antibodies were all given every week, independent how the patient was responding. And we learned this is too much. So it, increasingly, bispecific antibodies are not given weekly, but biweekly, monthly, and in some countries, even every two months. And with this, you can actually see, and these are experimental data, that the T cells are getting less exhausted. Now you need fit T cells that your bispecific antibodies are really producing tumor killing and that your T cells are still able to control infections. So one argument to give um, bispecific antibodies, not weekly, but rather every second week, especially in patients that responded. And um, Niels van den Donk show that this is possible and actually by prolonging the treatment-free interval between the applications of bispecific antibodies, he could show that the severe infection rate could be uh, reduced from 33.3% to 15.6%. Now at the EHA, they also studied whether this had an, an impact on the quality of response or the duration of response and surprisingly also by actually increasing the treatment-free interval between the administrations of bispecific antibody, most of the patients remained in remission. 96% of patients were res further responding. So I think this is what we learn increasingly. We have to use our bispecific antibodies better than we use them up to now. And here you can see one important point in this, the better the patient is responding, the longer the progression-free survival. So uh, in, 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 in black, you see all patients. In, in blue, you see patients that have a very good response. And in red, patients that have a complete respo response. So the depth of response has a major impact on the outcome of bispecific antibodies. I'm just skipping this. 
another bispecific antibody that is available in several European countries is talcetamab, which is also addressing another surface antigen on the myeloma cell, GPRC5D. And here you learn something about the speed of the responses. So already after one month, most of the patients are responding. So you can really see if a patient is going to respond or not. It takes longer until the patient gets a very good partial remission and even longer until the patient receives a complete remission. But after one month, normally a patient should already start responding. And here you see responses in patients receiving this bispecific antibody, which is about the same as the BCMA targeting bispecific antibody, and actually, which is very interesting. And we learned this also in, in, uh, with our patients, that a patient who is failing BCMA targeting bispecifics, for example, take list them up or erata, eranatamab can still respond to talcetamab. And we have very nicely uh, salvaged patients after failing BCMA bispecifics with GPRC5D targeting bispecifics. I go over this. Um, So another point how is how can we improve the efficacy of bispecific antibodies? And we have learned from mouse models that adding emits, that means lenalidomid and especially pomalidomide, is increasing the efficacy of bispecific antibodies. And now this is at a certain risk because both agents can induce cytopenias, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, but that was not a major issue. And also the, the infection rate was a little bit higher, but it was not um, um, beyond 40-15%. Uh, but what we learned is by adding homalidomid, for example, here to talcetamab, this very much increased the response rate. And here you can see response rate with uh, talcetamab alone, 71%, adding pomalidomide, one could increase the um, overall response rate to 93.8%. So a, quite an interesting improvement in responses. And also the median progression-free survival, which was 10 months for talcetamab alone and was um, probably around 18, 20 months in this combination. So adding additional agents to bispecific antibodies can improve their efficacy. So um, if we now go to what we do, so one important point is that we should extend the treatment-free interval and we should combine to make bispecific antibodies more effective. Now also CAR T cells we are working on and we are trying to improve their efficacy. And that is by moving them to earlier lines of therapy. And earlier lines of therapy is an important issue because what we try is by giving them earlier, we can better control the tumor load, thereby reduce cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity, cytopenia and infections. And also this delayed neurotoxicity, which is also depending on the tumor load prior to CAR T cell therapy. So that's one of the reasons why we do CAR T cell therapy now in earlier lines of therapy. And there are three other arguments. One is the earlier we take the T cells for making CAR T cells, the fitter the T cells are. We don't want the patient who have received a lot of chemotherapy, which induces resistant clones, and also the patient who has received less prior treatment will tolerate the treatment better. And here are the results of the so-called CARTITUDE 4 trial that now applies CAR T cells in second or third line therapy. And here you can see the amazing response rate, 99.4% of a complete remission rate of 86%, that's a response that we have never seen before. 
And here you can also see the earlier you give your CAR T cells, the better the progression-free survival, and furthermore, the lower the toxicity actually. And we are currently moving CAR T cells already to first-line therapy. And you can nicely see the so-called CARMA-2 uh, uh, cohort 2C study in which patients that only achieved a partial response or less following autologous stem cell transplantation, so patients at really high risk of relapsing, they were then receiving CAR T cell therapy. They improved their response quality in 84% Actually, 74% of these patients achieved a complete remission. And if you look now at the median progression-free survival, this is amazing. And that's the feeling why a lot of myeloma experts feel that with CAR T cell therapy, moving to earlier lines of therapy, we have a curative potential. And there are new studies uh, that are now using CAR T cells in first-line therapy Karma 9, patients who have a suboptimal response CAR T cell uh, to, to transplant receive CAR T cells as a kind of salvage and to improve the response and the disease control. And there are two studies, CARMA 6, uh, CARTITUDE 6 and CARTITUDE 5, in which we are looking at replacing autologous stem cell transplantation by uh, CAR T cell therapy. And just maybe, I think I'm soon running out of time, but this is the last uh, or another study I just wanted to show you where we are including bispecific antibodies in the treatment of multiple myeloma prior to stem cell transplantation and also following stem cell transplantation. And we've seen uh, uh, responses that we have never seen before. So I think also by including bispecific antibodies in the first line therapy, we can improve dramatically the response rate. And the responses were so impressive that there is now um, in several countries, the strategy to remove um, or replace autologous stem cell transplantation by a combination of bispecific antibodies targeting two different antigens on the cell surface. Um, let me just see, I think I have, I have a few minutes left. So uh, an, a, a major issue in CAR T cell therapy and with bispecific antibodies is the situation that these new treatments are targeting only one antigen on the cell surface. And the myeloma cell is a very clever tumor cell. And so what happened is that if we target only one surface antigen on the myeloma cells with CAR T cells and bispecifics, that the myeloma cells are changing and adapting. So this was a patient, I think the first patient um, that we described who had a very nice expansion of CAR T cells. The, CAR, the patient had never achieved a complete remission. He had three transplants, several other treatments, and only with CAR T cells, he achieved a complete remission. He remained in complete remission for several months. And this on the left side, you see this bone marrow analysis and we see this brown staining. So this patient had a very strong expression of the BCMA molecule on the myeloma cells. Then suddenly after several months, the patient had a relapse of uh, his multiple myeloma. We did an analysis again and here you see that the brown staining is completely lacking. So this patient, these myeloma cells had no BCMA on the cell surface and we found genetic causes for this. And this means of course, then this patient will not respond anymore to any BCMA directed therapy. And so what we learned is that we have to address other surface antigens. And one of them is GPRC5D, 
That is, for example, Talcata map, which you can use after BCMA has failed. But in addition, there are also CAR T cells that are targeting BCMA um, uh, like this one. And you can see that a patient who has failed BCMA-directed CAR T cell therapy still has a good chance to respond to uh, GPRC5 detargeting CAR T cells. Even 36% of patients are achieving a complete remission. So this is um, how we get around these resistance mechanisms. Unfortunately, we also found that myeloma cells can downregulate GPRC5D and therefore also escape from talcatamab or GPRC5D targeting by specific antibodies. So we need additional targets for CAR T cell therapy. And at least in, in Würzburg, we try to work on um, new targets in myeloma, for example, targeting SLAMF7 or O2, to, to be able to really overcome these resistance mechanisms. Um, yeah, so with this, I think I'm at the end of my presentation. I just want to summarize what we have learned at EHA, standard of care in transplant eligible patients is still for drug induction and consolidation with high dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplantation, followed by combination of lenalidomid plus as an anti CD38 antibody. We've seen impressive data with four years progression free survival of 84% and a projected median uh, uh, pro progression-free survival of far beyond 10 years. We still have unmet medical needs like ultra-high-risk newly diagnosed myeloma, early relapse, or patients that have been exposed to all three new drugs. And finally, uh, CAR T cell therapy is the most active treatment that we have ever seen in multiple myeloma with an overall response rate of nearly 100%, complete remission rate in some studies of 90%. The question is, we, the follow-up is still short. Are we really curing these patients that are so nicely responding or are they relapsing at a certain time point? There is the question about long-term toxicity of CAR T cell therapy. We have patients that have long-term cytopenia, so they're neutropenic, thrombocytopenic. Some patients have to receive stem cells to really uh, boost their um, um, blood uh, producing capacity. And we have some issues about these late neurotoxicities, fortunately enough, are very rare. Um, we increasingly, with this very effective CAR T cell therapy and biospecifics, are challenging the current treatments in frontline, either by adding biospecifics and adding CAR T cells to the current treatments or replacing stem cell transplantation by CAR T cell therapy or biospecific antibodies. We are still working on improving CAR T cell therapy by preventing antigen escape. That's by making CAR T cells that are targeting more than one surface antigen and therefore um, trying to prevent this e tumor escape and also a, a, um, T cell engaging antibodies, bispecific antibodies. I think we clearly learned that we have to increase the treatment free interval, especially in patients that have responded to reduce the infection rate. Also, multi targeting might be important for for bispecific antibodies and the first dry specific antibodies are really being tested in clinical trials and for bispecific antibodies we also learned that by the addition of certain agents like imid cell mods we can improve their efficacy and with this i'm at the end of my presentation thank you all for your kind attention and very interested to listen to your questions Thanks so much.
Thank you, Dr. Einzele. Uh, thank you. We can now um, thank you for the overview, uh, the nice overview of um, your most um, take home messages from EHA. Um, we have a few questions in the Q&A and hopefully more will come while we discuss. Um, but maybe um, before I move to uh, so we have questions asked chronologically mm. uh, while you were talking. We also have uh, questions about BlendRev. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, results that were presented about other uh, compounds, not CAR T, not by specifics, just mm. you know to have an idea of what might become available for patients who are not anywhere close yeah. from having yeah. access to CAR T and by specifics. Yeah. No, I, I, I didn't mention the um, Belantamab, Mafototin, the Blenrep, because it's actually currently not available in Europe for patients. But on the other hand, we have seen two very, very exciting studies, TREAM7 and TREAM8, which are specifically targeting to patients that are, for example, lenalidomid refractory, and we have seen that, for example, the com in, in one study, it was the comparison between Plenrep and Daratumumab in a certain combination. In the other one, it was the comparison between Plenrep, uh, POMDEX versus Velcade POMDEX. And in both trials, it was impressively to see how much more effective the arm with plan rep was. So I guess it's it's coming back. It will be available for our patients, hopefully end of 2025, 2000, beginning 2026. Mm -hmm. And it will be clearly a new option also for patients that, for example, are not qualifying for CAR T cells by specifics or that prefer a kind of outpatient therapy instead of being admitted to the hospital, which is currently at least essential for CAR T cell therapy and bispecific antibodies. Also interesting data about Selinexor, Selinexor combinations with, um, with Welcade, with dexamethasone, um, some more combinations also with daratumumab or with cafilzumib. And also Selinexor is, is available. It's available for fourth line therapy. And it's also available for second line therapy in a combination with bortezomib and dexamethasone. And clearly, a very effective agent. Um, one has to work on the side effect profile, but I think we have learned to manage this agent much better than we did it in the past. So, I was going to ask you about the yeah, side effects. Yeah, I think yeah. that was a, one of the major. Um, downsides of blend yeah. rep and maybe Selinexor as well on a on a different level. What what do you think patients uh, who might be listening to us uh, right now should uh, should know about the the side effects and how the side effect management is uh, improving with time and experience? I think what we have learned with the plan rep is that we can extend the, the treatment free interval like we we now start to do it with the bispecific antibodies and that this is obviously reducing this ocular toxicity without actually reducing the efficacy and with selenix so it's also the dose reduction and an improved management of the fatigue and and the nausea um, and the weight loss and um, we have now several patients that that really with with additional treatment, also with some dose adaptations, seem to tolerate this drug um, uh, extremely well. I'm, I'm I have now patients that are on Selenexor for more than one year, and um, it, it it works quite it works very well, and it's 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 also well tolerated. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a lot of questions on CAR T cell therapy. So mm. I'll start with uh, uh, first one on um, the age. Um, so do you see an, uh, any maximum age for CAR T cell therapy eligibility? Or what are your criteria? So our oldest patient that we treated was 84. Oh. Um, yeah. 
So you can see, and, and uh, he managed this CAR T cell therapy extremely well and had no major tox uh, toxicity. So I think as long as you have a good tumor control, this is important in, in, in CAR T cells. If you get the tumor load down and the patient does not re um, develop a severe CRS, cytokine release syndrome, or, or uh, neurotoxicity, and, and is not too cytopenic at the time of CAR T cell infusion, CAR T cell therapy is extremely well tolerated. Okay. Um, what do you think are the current barriers to a broader use of CAR T beyond the obvious access issues? I think that question was asked even before you started talking about CAR T coming to um, early lines of therapy. So mm -hmm. what should we expect? We know there might be logistic issues. Um, there might be manufacturing issues. How do you think this is evolving and what are the, the current barriers? I think, first of all, as, as you very clearly pointed out, we have the problem that it's not available in, in all European countries. Unfortunately, that is a big issue. Uh, in addition, there is, is clearly a manufacturing problem. At the moment, I don't see this actually in Germany. Uh, if, if we go for, for a CAR T cell product for a patient, we have it in, in a few weeks. This is This is quite easy we seem to have enough slots for the patients that are qualifying or are, are volunteering to go for car t-cells we also have patients that prefer going to buy specifics um, and an issue is is clearly the time between the leukapheresis and the car t-cell infusion the so-called vein to vein time because sometimes it can take six to eight weeks and for a patient who has a disease which is difficult to control, six weeks can be sometimes very, very long to have a, a, a sufficient tumor control. So this is an issue. And, and some some groups have now started to do the leukapheresis, then switch the patient to a bispecific, treat the patient with a bispecific, and then give CAR T cells, which seems to work in, 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 in some patients. But you are right. It's 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 availability is is clearly an issue, and not in all the patients where you actually do a leukapheresis, you get a product that is in spec, so that it fulfills all the criteria, and then it's always a question whether you can give it back to the patient or whether you should try for a new production. Um, so not all the the products are of best quality. That's also an issue in, in, in CAR T cell therapy. Okay. I'm curious about um, the profile of the patients who prefer not having CAR T versus having bispecifics. Mm. Can you tell us a bit more about those choices and uh, how the decision is being made? Yeah. So f first of all, uh, not all the centers can do CAR T cell therapy which means that if you want to have a CAR T cell therapy, you have to be referred to a certain center. Mm -hmm. Not all the patients like to be referred to, a, to another center. So if the, 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 the center that was caring for the patient is providing bispecifics but not CARs, then a lot of patients will probably go for bispecifics. I then see. there is an issue. Um, in bispecifics, you have to admit the patient only for a few days. And then it's a completely an outpatient mm -hmm. treatment. Some patients don't like to be admitted, don't like to be um, monitored for a certain time. It's, it's getting shorter, but it still needs a few days you have to spend in hospital. This is an issue. And, and there are also some concerns about the toxicity of CAR T cells. On the other hand, CAR T cells is, is a one and done treatment. And, and a lot of patients that have received CAR T cells tell me that it's fantastic. They receive their CAR T cells, no further treatment, and for months or years, no, no treatment. I have one patient who has received his CAR T cells four years ago, and he's still in molecular remission now, and, and he has no treatment for four years and, and has a perfect quality of life. So 
this is something which is uh, speaks for for CAR T cells because other all other treatments are continuous treatments until relapse. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of, 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 you know, duration of treatment, I think I've heard you once uh, at a conference saying you were in favor of no maintenance after CAR yeah. T yeah. because that's the beauty of it. It's a one and yeah. down. Is the, I know there are ongoing trials um, trying uh, maintenance after CAR T. Mm. Do you think the, the recent data is going to change your opinion or maybe change it in the future? What what do you think of uh of those trials and uh, what can come out of it? I think I think the 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 again the beauty of CAR T cells it's a one time treatment and I think um, it, for for me it shows that people that are using maintenance are not believing in CAR T cells because otherwise you, they wouldn't put a maintenance therapy in. Uh, that means you need additional treatment for the tumor control. It, it could be an argument because the persistence of the CAR T cells in myeloma is, is rather short. And by giving, for example, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, cell molds, you will probably increase the persistence and maybe the activity of the CAR T cells. But I think this is at the expense of additional treatment, at the expense of additional side effects. And so I think... <laughs> I I think we should wait until we have more data about long-term outcome of CAR T cell therapy. Mm -hmm. I think I was really impressed <laughs> about, for example, CARTITUDE 6, where patients with six lines of cryotherapy, where we know that we normally achieve maybe four months progression-free survival, that these patients were progression-free after three years, mm -hmm. a lot of them. And I guess if you go earlier, you might have a much longer progression free survival. Maybe we are already curing patients <laughs> with CAR T cell therapy. And I think we need more data and not say just yes, put, put in this and put in the next one drug and just wait a little bit and see how much we can and learn more about why, why are patients failing CAR T cells? Why are they benefiting from before already putting again? all these drugs in. I see. Thanks. Um, I have one last question about CAR-T and then I'll move to MRD and bispecifics and mm. frontline treatments. Um, uh, regarding the infection risks with CAR-T, and this is also true um, with bispecifics, can you tell us a bit more about um, how those side effects are managed or what's the prophylaxis recommendations and what um, patients do to stay safe during those treatments or after uh, CAR-T? So, f f first of all, I think at the moment, in, in summertime, it's not such, not such an issue. Mm -hmm. I think what you what you definitely have to do is immune globulin substitution. So every four weeks you should receive your immunoglobulin infusion. This has definitely an impact on certain infections, viral and bacterial infection. Secondly, you should do a prophylaxis. That means acyclovir against herpes virus infections, um, trimetoprim to protect against a, a certain. Uh, fungal infections, pneumocystis in patients. Um, you, you should monitor infections very carefully. And if you have fever, then really see a specialist and not go to, to your, probably to your general practitioner who probably has never heard about these infections that can occur in a patient that has received CAR T cell therapy. So go to a specialist that knows about this and get sufficient treatment as early as possible. And I think at the moment, most centers will be very careful for at least one to two years after CAR T cell therapy. I guess that we will have some certain biomarkers that help us to, to really see when the patient has regained the, his immune or her immune function, probably CD4 positive T cell counts and other parameters will help us here. But I, I guess that during the first year or two years, 
there will be clearly an infection risk and you have to stick to your prophylaxis and your immunoglobulin infusion. And the same applies also to bispecific antibodies. Okay, thanks. That's very clear. Um, regarding diagnosis, do you know if there's any uh, development in early diagnosis initiatives? Um, this could mean even much more positive evolution in combination with new therapies. Um, I guess the earlier it's detected, the more efficient is this therapy, or what's your opinion? No, that's a that's a that's a, a very difficult question. I think in a in a lot of tumor diseases, we feel that the earlier we find the disease, the more effective we can control it. Now, in myeloma, this is monoclonal gammopathy or smoldering myeloma. And the, we already have trials that we are treating certain patients with smoldering myeloma if they fulfill certain criteria. On the other hand, patients with MGAS or smoldering myeloma often don't have any symptoms at all. And I, I always remember one of my patients I saw for the first time 17 years ago, and she presented with a smoldering myeloma. And she had some symptoms, and I, we, we were discussing, should we do treatment, yes or no? And we decided we should not treat. And this patient is, is seeing me every six months. Every six months, we are discussing treatment or no treatment. <laughs> since 17 years, and nothing happened. And I have mm. quite a few of these patients. Now, of course, you can treat them. Of course, you can reduce the, the M protein. Um, but is the patient really benefiting from this? I'm not so sure. And, and this patient, for example, I'm just seeing her form in front of me. She's walking uh, with her two dogs. She's enjoying life. Mm. She's traveling a lot without having any treatment at all. So I think in myeloma, it's a bit, it's a bit different from, for example, um, breast cancer or colon cancer, where clearly you should you diagnose the, the disease and you remove it or you do irradiate it. Or, but in myeloma, there are precursor states which you can control, but which do not mean that the patient is really suffering from anything and the patient is not uh, threatened by the disease it's it's a kind of, it's, it's a smoldering disease it's it's there but it's not threatening the patient and and therefore i think i'm i have no clear I, I, if a patient has a clear increase in the m protein if he develops symptoms then it's quite clear patient should yeah. receive treatment Interesting. but i, but I guess the question stable, was more about those who are, who have myeloma but yeah. have a misdiagn misdiagnosed while they already have a lot of symptoms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. An interesting point about smoldering myeloma and MGAS. Um, I have a few questions around MRD. Um, I was wondering if um, about MRD driven decisions, you, you've spoken about few trials. Do you think you have enough data to now use it um, routinely in your clinic, or maybe you're already doing it uh, outside of clinical trials? And if it's the case, can you give us some examples of how you are using it and how it impacts treatment decisions? Yeah, so it, it, it's especially in high-risk patients, I, I tend to do it because we know that these patients need an MRD-negative state. And so in a, in a lot of patients, we are using MRD measurement to decide whether we should do a consolidation, whether we should do maintenance, whether we should stop maintenance. Because some patients really have an issue when they take lenalidomide, they get skin alterations, they get infections, they get fatigue, they get diarrhea, they get obstipation. So it's, 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 it's a tablet but it produces side effects. Mm -hmm. And I always remember a patient when lenalidomide was not accepted as maintenance therapy who came to me and said, I, I, I heard about lenalidomide. I want lenalidomide. Fight against my insurance company. I want it. And we finally made it. We got him lenalidomide. But after two years, 
and he was in, in, in he was in complete remission. He came back to me and said, uh, "I'm so grateful to you that you made it possible that I can take lenalidomid, but this drug is not so easy. I have so many side effects, and and after two years now in good remission, I want to stop." And, and really, most of the patients want to stop. Mm -hmm. Now, if the patient is MRD negative, for me and for the patient, it's much easier to say, let's stop. Okay. If he is still positive, I would probably try to persuade or to, to motivate the patient to continue lenalidomide. Mm -hmm. And, and for example, the question is... about a second transplant, sometimes we have the question about second transplant patients says, I didn't, uh, he has a high risk disease and he did a first transplant and we would go for a second. And then he has a, an a MRD negative state. Then we feel both the patient and myself, we feel better not to go ahead with a second transplant. Okay, I see. Is there any evolution in getting MRD analysis via serum um, versus yeah, um, there is. bone there marrow is. biopsies? Yeah, so there is new there are new techniques to to more sensitively detect the M protein. Um, there are also techniques to detect myeloma cells in the peripheral blood. Mm -hmm. um, I think at the moment these technologies are not as established as MRD from the bone marrow, but I'm optimistic by certain technical modifications. And in a few years, we will be there that we can monitor MRD negativity in the peripheral blood. Okay, thanks. I have a question um, that is specific to um, is it Tiximab? We have someone with high risk myeloma on the ISA RVD trial, and after stem cell transplant went into remission and have remained in remission now for two years. Uh, for the patients asking the question, this is looking like a cure. So the person is wondering why is a tiximab is not viewed uh, positively, particularly as it appears to have mild side effects. Yeah, I think this is a very good question. It's the same applies for Dara tumor mabananti and the CD38 antibody. I think we have now studies where we use uh, VRD or, or RVD plus anti CD38 antibody, isatuximab or daratumumab. And both studies showed that the addition of the uh, anti CD38 antibody improves the response rate and improves progression free survival. And therefore, I guess we will have the approval of um, ISA. VRD and DARA VRD definitely very soon. And we probably will also have the approval of DARA lenalidomid and maybe with some other studies also ESA lenalidomid for maintenance. So I think this is definitely coming and the patient has is completely right. The additional side effects are rather mild. It's a very little additional toxicity, but obviously a quite um, a quite good improvement of the efficacy. So I completely agree with this patient. Okay, thank you. I have one last question to ask you. Uh, it's about CAR T again, and the question is about if it's possible to repeat CAR T cell therapy if it fails. For example, after thirty six months. That's very specific, um, and. Uh, Depending on your answer, uh, you can also tell us if it would be the same product or um, different products or even different um, targets, and if there's a window of time um, that is more appropriate. This is really an expert patient. <laughs> <laughs> so um, up to now, um, we were very reluctant to reuse the same car t product. Actually, in the KARMA trial, patients were retreated and the response rate was very low and the progression-free survival rather short. I think it's different if the patient is remaining in remission for three years. Then the question really comes up whether you can reuse it. But in principle, I would go for another product, okay. probably a less, less immunogenic product. And 
The question about a new target is an extremely good question. I think whenever we use these novel, expensive, and also sometimes toxic drugs, we should at least screen the patient whether the target antigen is still present. It, because we have seen quite a few patients that lost BCMA, quite a lot of patients that lost GPRC5D. So if you use another immunotherapy, you should at least check whether the target is uh, still uh, available on the myeloma cell before you give this potentially toxic and very expensive treatment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at six o'clock is the end of our webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Einzele, for being there, presenting your highlights from um, EHA this year and for, for answering all our questions. This webinar uh, is recorded and will be available on our website and through our usual social media channels. Um, so thank you again. And if you have any last word for the audience, uh, Dr. Einzele, the floor is yours. Yeah, so I think EH again, EHA again has shown how much improvement we have made for patients with multiple myeloma. And I think it's definitely the time to stop to call myeloma a disease which is not curable. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. And I wish everyone a very pleasant evening.